Hello and welcome back to the first episode of Japan Memo Season 3, the IISS Japan Chair Program podcast where we are joined by experts, strategists and practitioners to unpack why Japan matters in today's regional and global geopolitical landscape. I'm Robert Ward, the IISS Japan Chair and Director of Geoeconomics and Strategy. I'm Yuka Koshino, IISS Research Fellow for Security and Technology Policy. And I'm Mariko Tagashi, IISS Research Fellow for Japanese Security and Defense Policy. For the first episode of this year, we are delighted to welcome Kanehara Nobukatsu Sensei back to help us unpack the most significant developments in Japanese security and defense policy since the post war period, Japan's three new national security documents. Kanehara Sensei is a professor at the Faculty of Law at Doshisha University and senior advisor at the Asia Group in Washington, D.C. Prior to this, Kanehara Sensei served as Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary to Prime Minister Abe Shinzo from 2012 to 2019. In 2013, Kanehara Sensei also became the inaugural Deputy Secretary General of the National Security Secretariat, a role which he held until his retirement from government service in 2019. Kanehara Sensei also appeared in our first ever Japan Chair Programs webinar in 2020 on Japan's grand strategy in the Reiwa era, which can be found on the website for those interested in hearing more. So, welcome, Kanehara Sensei. We are very glad to have you here today. Thank you very much for having me. One of the biggest events in terms of Japanese security policy in the second part of last year was, of course, the Release in December of the three major strategic documents the National Security Strategy, which was the first revision since the first ever NSS came out in 2013, the National Defense Strategy, and the Defense Build Up Program. These three documents represent a real shift in Japan's post war security and defense policy. And on releasing the documents, Prime Minister Kishida Fumio emphasized that the world is at a historical crossroads and that these documents are intended to address this reality. Kanihara Sensei, as our first question then, as a departure from previous strategies, what do you think is the historical significance of these three new documents? The national security strategy was first written 10 years ago under Prime Minister Abe. As far as the diplomacy of foreign policy is concerned, there is no big leap from there. We stick to the basic values, still continue to support the liberal international order. The axis of this policy is the Japan US alliance and the coordination with the allies and the coalitions, the like minded nations. But what was lacking there was the military power to support this. The free and open in the Pacific strategy, quads, and these things are sort of networking and frameworking. But the biggest challenge is now, of course, Chinese rise. When Abe took power, China was Japan's size. When Abe left the government, The、China was three times bigger than Japan. Only during eight years, they became three times bigger than Japan. And the military budget is not huge, it's bigger than the military budgets of Japan, France, UK, and Germany combined. And now it's still growing. And Xi Jinping became an absolute monarch of that empire. And nobody can stop him now. And his trophy is the annexation of Taiwan. And suddenly, the possibility of warfare. Became somehow real. Now it's real in everybody's mind, the policymakers' mind in Japan and in Washington too. Now we have to change our military policy. This is what Mr. Kishida is now doing to back up the foreign policy and the strategy of Prime Minister Abe. He can claim his own credit for this and he's doubling the defense budget in coming five years' time. And he is now preparing for a new posture, military posture of Japan to deter. The Taiwan contingency, of course, with the United States and other like minded nations. You mentioned the doubling of the defense budget, which obviously got a lot of attention in the press. When you looked at the documents for the first time, particularly on the military policy side, as you say, what were the highlights for you in terms of what these documents offered on the military side? The Japanese press is now talking a lot about their offensive capabilities, that is, the intermediate range missiles. We had none, absolutely none. <laughs> Our defense posture was so defense oriented. The longest missile we had before was 200 kilometers. Abe san said, no, no, we have to have a bit more. So 10,000 kilometer missiles Abe san started to buy, but it's the very limited number. But to deter any aggressors, the five or 10 missiles are not, not at all enough. We have to have a massive arsenal of intermediate range missiles. Outside Japan, Taiwan, Korea, our friends, and not very friendly nations like North Korea, 
and China have a huge amount of intermediate range missiles that can reach Japan, Korea, Guam, and Taiwan. So we have to counter these offensive weapons by having our own offensive weapons. And this is a big leap in our military posture. During the Cold War time, even during the Cold War time, we have none. We are now showing that our offensive capabilities, that simply we can say, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. <laughs> this is now a big leap in our posture. One of the things that struck me reading the documents was the focus on trying to get the public and the private sectors to work together in terms of technology and getting the advantages of what, of what both sectors offer. As you and I and Anyuka have discussed in the past, that you know, Japan has a, a difficulty with civil military divide. Do you think that this document is a step forward in, in trying to address that divide? And where do you think we are in terms of what the government needs to do to further narrow that gap? It's a heavy weight lifting, I have to say. Japan is like a Germany, we a defeated nation. And from the other sectors, the military, all the military elements were eliminated, in particular in academia. And they are strongly pacifists and very much leftists during the Cold War. They refused to cooperate with the Defense Ministry and Pentagon. As far as national security is concerned, they say we don't cooperate with the government. That's a very strong position. And the government is now trying to, to, to persuade them, no, you have to work for the government. They take 4 trillion yen. It's almost 80% of the previous national defense budget. And they say we don't contribute to national defense. We say, excuse me, sir, but you have to do that. In any nations, the national security is strongly combined with the top-notch science and technology. And we are trying to persuade them. Kishida-san prepared 500 million yen for two years just to persuade the scientists and professors in universities. But I have to say the 75 years of pacifism and the refusal to cooperate for national security, it's not easy to engage these professors, but we are now trying to do that. What do you think were the main triggers for the shift in the mentality towards Japan's defence posture? The last 10 years, we saw China became three times bigger than the suddenly. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? When Abe-san took power, China was our size. We didn't fear them because we are with the Americans in alliance. We have many friends in Europe and in Asia. And China cannot cause a big trouble. But now they are three times bigger than Japan. They're 75% of the U.S. economic size. Their military budget is five times bigger than Japan. Japan's military budget is as big as France or UK. So it's a huge military forces and economic entity is China. And they can push their way forward as they wish. Nobody can stop them now in one stroke. So now we have to craft a, a good strategy backed up by the military capabilities. Otherwise, China can have their own way. Mr. Xi Jinping is a bit different from the previous leaders. He's a bit narrow, and he is targeting at Taiwan directly. And we have to be very careful. And what about the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Do you think that had an impact in further shaping policy in Japan? Japan is, as I said, like Germany, it's, you know, the pacifism after the war is very strong in this nation, but they, they saw that the leaders of some nations can make a big mistake, as stupid ones, and slaughtering people, the innocent people, and we see that the images every day on TV, that a deep impact upon Japanese public opinion, or this can happen to us too. Mr. Putin's failure is the characteristic of the dictatorship. Nobody can say no to the leader. If the dictator serves as a leader for 20 years, nobody can say no to him. When he comes up with the, some illusion, the dream, I had a good dream, I will have to invade there. <laughs> and nobody can stop him. And this happened to, in reality in Ukraine, and the people are dying there because of that. And if Xi Jinping can serve 10 more years, he is late 70s, and he might make a, the same mistake like Putin. So we have to be prepared. There's no break to be put upon the absolute leader in the dictatorship. Thank you, Kanehara-sensei. And I think you've already touched on Japan possessing and developing interrange missiles, possessing more 
offensive side of capabilities might be a highlight from these documents. One of the largest changes in the national security strategy is Japan's policy to acquire counterstrike capabilities. The debate of this topic has been there for many decades, um, since mid-1950s, actually. Could you give us your sense on why the government decided to change the policy now? And the second question would be, what does this mean for Japan and the region's deterrence capabilities? I was the proponent of having the counteroffensive capabilities. We worked on that for 10 years, and Abe-san gave us the green lights. So we started to acquire JASM JASM missile. That's American-made missile, the 10,000 kilometers air-to-soil missile. But it was a very small quantity. It is not at all enough to deter any aggressors. Now the government has decided to have a huge arsenal of the intermediate range missile to deter any aggression in the in the region against Japan, against our, our neighbors too. The reason is very simple. Ten years ago, the China was our size, as I said. Now China is huge, and they have almost 2,000 missiles that can reach Japan. This is new reality. And Americans and Russians were bound by INF Treaty. Trump just trashed it and Putin just followed it. They must be happy to see China expanding their arsenal of intermediate range missiles. So these three would expand their missiles. And North Korea has developed nuclear bombs carried by the intermediate range missiles too. And South Koreans, Taiwanese are having their own intermediate non-nuclear missiles. So the atmosphere is now changing very rapidly outside Japan. So simply we have to follow them. Thank you. What about um, Japan's ability to actually develop and acquire these counterstrike capabilities or the missiles that you've discussed? The next fiscal year's budget request, it seems like they they have more aspirational goals to push forward their timeline to develop them. Do you think the current status of Japan's defense industries, do you think they will be able to meet these goals to develop these missiles? We have good technology for missiles. It was politically restricted to 200 kilometers. Now, it's not so difficult for us to extend the range, but we have to develop our technology for targeting, guiding precisely. This is something we have to do now. My personal goal is to have hypersonic missiles, intermediate ones in quantity, massive quantity. We have abolished the cluster bombs. We don't have nuclear bombs. So what we have to do is to have a massive, precisely guided hypersonic missiles. But it takes time for that. Not hypersonic ones are easier, but even for that, it takes time. So meantime, we have to introduce maybe American tomahawks and these things to fill the gap. Thank you very much for adding that very important point around hypersonics and procuring a U.S. tomahawks as well um, for the early phase. Maybe one more last question for me around defense. In that three documents, it includes uh, Japan's first ever post-war national defense strategy, or the NDS, modeled on the U.S. document of the same nature. Um, how do you assess Japan's first national defense strategy and its effectiveness as a warfighting strategy? The national defense program outline, the previous documents, we changed the name. The previous documents, national defense program outline was a stupid paper. It was written in 1965, 1976. The purpose was to put the ceiling upon the expansion of our military capabilities. It was done by Prime Minister Mickey. Absolutely no sense of strategy there. We put the ceiling on that in this way. We are a pacifist nation. And the reasoning for that, putting the ceiling upon our military forces was that we cannot create a vacuum in the region. If Japan becomes a vacuum of power, we can invite warfare in the region. So we cannot destabilize the region. So we have the bare minimum military forces that was the strategy. And this is stupid. We have to prepare for the enemies, right? Enemies can vary from Soviet Union to Russia to North Korea to China to everybody to anybody else. So you have to change your posture in accordance with your possible enemies. Prime Minister Mick said we have no enemies. We have to be content with the bare minimum military forces. That's our fate. That's where our pacifism. Now we completely abandoned this idea because we have to be prepared for the scenario-based threat. And the most fearful one is the invasion of Taiwan by China. If that happens, Americans will go in. If they go in, they pat our shoulders, please come together with us. (laughs) And we'll be there. In 1960, when we devised the security treaty with Americans, we surrendered our defense obligations of Taiwan Islands over Americans, and they took over. But they said we, the Americans must must be able to use bases in Japan. 
And we said, that's right, you can do that. We gradually increased our responsibility to help them in the logistic operations in 1999 by Prime Minister Obuchi. And 2015, Prime Minister Abe has even said we could join combat operations using the self-defense right. We are increasing our contribution to the American defense of our outer regions like Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, Taiwan Islands. That means we could be frontal nation like Taiwan. Americans are far away. They will be never hurt seriously, but we can be hurt very seriously. So we have to be well prepared. And our policy is very simple, the keeping the status quo, the peace over the strait. Shifting the topic a little from defense capability to a broader security strategy, Japan's new security strategy also expands the scope of national security to include economic security as part of the strategy, which isn't only about the economic security section, but is actually ingrained in the whole document. Do you believe this shift is critical in creating a holistic security strategy? Is this a continuum of the strategy of Japan's comprehensive security that Japan has long held? Like you said at the beginning, no big leap, or is this something quite new? And how do you think Japan can effectively integrate economic security policies into its broader national defense strategy? It's new and it's old. After the defeat of the Pacific War, Japanese didn't talk about much about the military strategy. We talked about the economic strategy, ODA, or the help for the developing nations. And we said this is important to build a peace, but the, we dodged the responsibility for the military affairs. When they talk about national security, they tend to focus upon the military things only. So we have to expand our national security discussions over whole range not only economic affairs, social affairs, cultural affairs, climate change, and the military affairs. Before, the government tends to eliminate the military part. We said the comprehensive national security strategy, in particular, Prime Minister Ohira said that. The purpose was not to talk about the military affairs very much. Now we are trying to talk about the military affairs, but we should not focus too much focus on the military affairs. We have to expand the scope of discussions. To engage China from the position of strength, we have to, one, unite the West, and the West must cooperate to unite their economic power and the power of narratives and military power. We have to engage a whole range of resources there. And Americans say very often the dime, dime diplomacy, information, and the military affairs and economy, right? And this kind of comprehensive approach is very much necessary to avoid the war, to deter the aggression. Now the government is, my government is now thinking about that. Our strategy must expand into every level of resources. I think that's a right decision to do. Thank you for explaining where economic security sits in the broader security strategy. As you said, the document sets the goal for Japan to convene all state power to another level for its security. And the goal is clear, so I'd like to ask you a little bit about the implementation. As we've discussed, these strategies and the content had to overcome a large amount of public, political, and historic obstacles to get to where they are now. Since the release and even before, several issues have created a lot of debate, notably the ability to fund the defense budget increased to 2% of GDP, personnel and staffing issues, and the current instability of the Kishida administration. How might these elements impact the feasibility of the strategies in the short run and the long run? You need a strong government to implement a difficult policy. It's not security policy, it's the power game of the LDP. And I believe that Kishida-san is stable. He was very stable with Abe-san. Abe-san had a strong grip upon the the right wing of the LDP. Kishida-san is very strong on the left wing of the LDP. And with Abe-san, Kishida-san has a very strong grip upon the, upon the whole party. After Abe-san's death, uh, it's a bit difficult to control the, the right wing of the LDP, but the right wing has no strong opponent against Kishida-san. And Kishida-san has no elections for coming two, three years. And next year is the year of the presidential election of the LDP. But it's not easy to launch the rebellion against Kishida-san. There's no reason to do that. Is doing the right thing. Kisa-san will survive. His popularity is not very high now, 35%, something like that. But it's not very low, neither. It's a low-altitude flight. But I think he will continue to govern the nation and he will implement what he wrote in these documents. 
changing tack a little bit now and looking at how these big changes are impacting the region and international perspectives. The changes that were in these three documents are pretty historic, particularly within the Japanese context. Has the reaction from China, Russia and North Korea been as you would expect? And how do you think these new strategies will affect the balance of power in the region? China does not make a big noise because even though we doubled the military budget, it's still 40% of the military budget. And they are still increasing the military budget. So <laughs> China must be concerned about the Americans and Japan-US alliance. And they don't fear us at all. They fear the Japan-US alliance and other coalitions. And the China now knows that they are preparing the annexation of Taiwan. If they can, they'll do it. And they are now calculating how difficult it would be if the whole West is united. That, uh, that, uh, that must be the lessons that they are taking from Putin's invasion of Ukraine. They do not make a big propaganda against us. Now they are simply calculating what they can do. Our increase of military capabilities is just a reaction to Chinese big leap in their military capabilities. If they don't do that, we don't have to do that. But China is now tilting the balance of the region heavily on their side. And to pull this balance back, Americans are now making efforts, but they are very much torn between Ukraine and China. They have to come back to Asia, but they will have to be complementarily help Americans. We don't have NATO here. We don't have British and French and Germans and Spanish, Italians and Poles and Turks. We don't have them. We have Koreans, and they are not yet very much regional. They are local. Taiwan is isolated, and Australia is a very good friend, very far away in the Southern Hemisphere. And the ASEAN nations are still very much hesitating to join this contingency. India is a strategic partner, and I don't believe that they could send their warships to help us. To keep a balance, Japan has to make efforts, but it's still complementary. Uh, maybe it's not enough. I have a question on how the U.S. views uh, the, the three documents. The documents were a result of close coordination and in consultation with the U.S., Japan's only ally, and also Japan's acquisition of counter-strike capabilities could change the nature of U.S.-Japan defense cooperation under the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. How do you think U.S. government perceive these strategies, and how do you think this relationship between uh, Washington and Tokyo will change after the three documents um, will be implemented? Well, U.S. is happy, simply, because they feel tired of being a policeman of the world affairs. And they are very much drawn into Europe because of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. In the long run, it's China. It's particular importance for the Americans to keep their dominance in Asia. Asia is a driving force of the world economy in this century. They cannot lose their hegemony in Asia. The friends are Japanese and Koreans and Taiwanese and Australians and some, some ASEAN nations. It's not at all as strong as NATO or EU in Europe. Korea is now expanding the military budget. They are becoming a military power. But their view is not yet very much global, neither regional. Americans won't engage Koreans. Japan is engaged in the world, world's strategic perspective, but our military efforts were not very much impressive, right? So what we are doing now is that Japan should pay their fair burden of military responsibility. Americans are happy to see that. Americans no longer see us as, as a threat. In 1970s, 80s, Americans were still doubtful of Japanese strategic direction. And our military capabilities increase was a source of concern for them. It's no longer. 10, 20 years ago, Americans are saying, oh, Japan should not have military space capabilities or long-range missiles. Now they say, except nuclear weapons, you can have anything. <laughs> That's today's Americans. And they need us, we need them. And I think they are very happy to see us making efforts. Building on Yuka's question, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that the new strategies continuously puts priorities on alliances and networks. And so I'd like to ask you about non-U.S. partners. The strategy has strong implications for Tokyo's relationship with allies and like-minded countries like non-U.S. NATO members, Australia and India. In Japan's National Defense Strategy section on collaboration with like-minded countries and others, the countries Japan identifies as key to cooperation are listed in the order of the U.S., Australia, India, the U.K., along with France, Germany, and Italy, NATO, and the EU, the Republic of Korea, Canada, and New Zealand, and others. After the U.S., how will these documents impact security cooperation between Tokyo, Canberra, and New Delhi? The FOIP, the Free and Open in the Pacific, is the 
idea of networking and frameworking, the basic idea is to connect the source of liberal order in the Atlantic, must be connected with the Pan Pacific region. It was possible in late 20th century, but we have to expand that into the Indian Ocean. And we have picked up a good ones, a big ones, and that's a basic idea. But if you talk about the power balance, the military affairs, strategic things, now you have to focus on the big ones, capable ones. And the biggest ones, of course, India. India is now half of Japanese economic size. They will surpass us in 10 years' time. And their population is bigger than the Chinese one. And they are 10 years younger than the Chinese. It's a very inward-looking <laughs> big nation. It's very difficult to engage. But they are born democracy. And they do share basic values with us. They are now rebalancing their foreign policy from the Moscow-oriented foreign policy towards the more balanced ones. They want to come closer to Japan-US alliance, in particular with the Americans. And they are very much welcome. We need them as a strategic partner, not a military partner, but a strategic partner. We need them. And inside the region, our closest ally is, of course, Australia. But their population is as big as Taiwan. They are far away from, from Japan, <laughs> from Taiwan. And they are very much our trusted ally. Australia is far away. And we need Koreans. They are a big nation now. The half size of Japan's population and one quarter of Japan's economic power, but as big as Canada or Russia. They are fully qualified for G7 membership as a size. We have to help them to have a global view. Young Koreans are talking about global Korea. It's very encouraging for us. They can share the responsibility with us. Japan was like that in the 1980s, 90s. We're talking about the global responsibility a lot. And the Middle East was a new front for Japan. We have a big national debate inside Japan. Shall, shall we go there to help Americans or help Westerners? And we should go there. We started to expand our military operations from the UN peacekeeping operations or sending ships to the Indian Ocean or even Iraq. Korea is now there. And if they expand their views, take strong position as a part of the Westerners, they are very much welcome. We have to develop ties with them. And ASEAN nations are a bit difficult. ASEAN is not, you know, one voice, one voice organization. There are very different opinions, insights. Their first job is to coordinate among themselves, not not with the, with the outsiders. But among the ASEAN nations, I have said Indonesia is the biggest nation. They don't fear China very much. And they have 300 million people and very rich in natural resources. So we have to engage in Indonesia in the first place. And then the Philippines is the American ally the vitally important location of the Philippines. And Vietnam is very close to China. And they have strong animosity against China. And they're very careful of dealing with the Chinese. And of course, uh, they know who China is. The Vietnam is a very strong military. And we have to engage them. Malaysia, after Najib, they are rebalancing their position vis-a-vis China. And we have to engage them. Thailand is a bit difficult because they're ethnically close to China. And they, they feel affinity with the Chinese civilizations. We do understand that. And they, they, they are ally of the United, United States, but they're very skillful diplomats. And they deal with China quite well too. But we have to engage them. Thailand is a very important source of investment for us. And many Japanese are working there. That's one of the most advanced nations in ASEAN. We need to engage Thailand. Myanmar is very difficult. We tried to engage Myanmar for a long time. But now they are killing kids on the streets. Now we can't help them in that way. We have to do something with Myanmar, but I see no no solution for the moment with Myanmar. Laos, Cambodia, small nations, but Laos is too close to China, but they are half brother of Vietnam. So Vietnam is controlling Laos somehow. So they do not go very close to China. Cambodia, they are now growing very fast. Chinese money is 20 times bigger than the Western money. But when Cambodia grows more, Western money is just frozen. Maybe we can make a balance with China to take back Cambodia. Brunei is a big problem because their deep sea oil resources are inside their nine dotted line. They illegally claim the Chinese maritime zones. So Brunei cannot say no to China, but maybe we have to do something to help them.
Just going back to South Korea, the NSS was clear about South Korea's importance to Japan as an important geopolitical neighbour, and I thought was very forceful on the importance of bilateral cooperation and trilateral cooperation between Japan, South Korea and the US. It was interesting that the Yoon government in South Korea in December 2022 came out with its own Indo-Pacific strategy. That I think it's the strategy for a free, peaceful and prosperous Indo-Pacific region, so quite a long title. What do you think are the prospects for South Korea-Japan cooperation following the release of this Indo-Pacific strategy from Seoul? We are comfortable with the conservative government in Seoul. The Im Young-bak, President Im Young-bak, even President Park Geun-hye, and Yoon son yeol the new president, we don't have a big difficulties to deal with the conservative government in, in Seoul. The leftist government makes a big difficulties with us all, all the time. And the problem is that their domestic politics is still very much influenced by their domestic Cold War. That's ended in Europe, in Japan too. But their democratization was 1987. All the leftist activists were all in jail. They jumped out. They created a new party for Koreans, in particular for the leftist Koreans. The Cold War is not over simply because North Korea is still there. Their brother, brother state for them. For the senior activist generation, North Korea is very dear to them. And so that, that's the reason why their strategic direction change, flips flops 180 degrees from leftist government to conservative government. That makes it very difficult for us to have a stable strategic cooperation with them. But with the Union, it's okay. We can, we can help them. My hope is new Koreans, young Koreans are very different from this ideological generation. They are very much realistic, optimistic. And they want to share the global responsibility as a, as a global power. And they are global power, in fact. So we have to help them. But for some time, I think they are flip-flopping between the leftist government and the conservative government will continue. That's the, the result of democratization for them. We have to accept it. Thank you very much for that helpful overview of how some ASEAN countries might view Japan's policies and, and where they are positioned in terms of the relation with China. But even um, for some countries that have very close economic ties with China in, in ASEAN countries, I think um, the, the annual kind of regional elite survey always shows that their security concerns are also very real. Um, do you think the Japan's national security strategy and national defense strategy, the Japan's policy that was written in these documents meet the expectation of Japan's security role um, that the regional countries expect Japan to play, especially given the fact that Japan has been very vocal about promoting uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. Do you think Japan is doing enough to enhance maritime security dimension of FOIP? Regional friends there, they don't want to be a part of this contingency, Taiwan contingency. Their inclination is to be neutral, but they do not want the dominance of China, neither. And they want the Americans and Japanese to do their job to keep the stability and peace in the region. That's their hope. And for that, uh, we are now making efforts. I think they simply welcome by many ASEAN nations. Do we contribute more to the maritime security? Uh, we are going to expand our fleet. That will, of course, enhance the stability of the region for the maritime security. Now, Chinese fleet is now 350 boats, big boats. It's bigger than the American fleet. We have now 55 destroyers. And China is now too big. And our contribution is somehow limited, but now still, still somehow meaningful contribution. Do you think Japan will be willing to join the region's joint exercises around maritime security? We are everywhere. We are now everywhere. Even Indians these days, they did not want to have a multilateral maritime naval exercise before. Now they are doing this Malabar where we are there with the Americans. And the multilateral cooperation for maritime security showing this unity is very important. Very, very important. If we face China one by one, we have to surrender in the end. It's only by unity that the West as a whole can engage Chinese. Showing this unity is very important, and the multilateral naval exercises are very symbolic for that. This brings us to our final two questions, Kanehara Sensei, which we ask every single one of our guests. And we've had some great answers, and I'm sure you will continue that uh, tradition. And the first one is, if you have a book recommendation for our listeners who wish to better understand Japan, and you are allowed to recommend your own excellent books as well. 
I wrote more than 10 books. Today, new book came out. <laughs> Congratulations. Title is Can You Win Over China? That was the first question asked by Prime Minister Abe when we wrote the Defense National Defense Program outline. Even before before being sold, it's, it's among the best sellers. <laughs> It's only in Japanese. I wrote ten, almost 10 books after I, I left the government, but it's all of them are in Japanese. My recommendation is to read in English the newly published three documents, Japan's National Security Strategy, Defense Strategy, and the Defense Program. It's, it's translated in good English. And it's a good start to understand what we are now thinking about. Thank you. The second question is, what do you think people often get wrong about Japan? I wrote an explanation or of the book of Dr. Kissinger, The World World Order. And there he wrote about Japan briefly, and he was seeing Japan in the 1970s. He wrote, Japan is in theory in the West, but in fact it is not. <laughs> it, he was so right. Japan was so divided, and it, it's, it's a rare case where the biggest opposition parties, Japanese socialists, were very close to Moscow. This was not the case with the French, Germans, Americans, and British. And Japanese public opinion was totally torn between Moscow and Washington. Government was very close to Washington, but our public opinion was totally torn. That's the reason why we could not have nationally shared strategy. We couldn't have it. 30 years after the end of the Cold War, finally we could come back to a national consensus and make a national strategy. Many thought before, Japan has no strategy, Japan has no national goal, it's simply bandwagoning the, the Americans. It is not the case. We had a strategy, but the public opinion was torn, then we could not explain that to the people. Now government is now up front to explain what we are thinking, what we have been thinking for 75 years. Now it, it's much more transparent, much easier than before to understand our strategic thinking. I recommend, again, the, to read the National Security Strategy written by Kishida government. Thank you very, very much, Kanehara Sensei. And, and thank you to all our listeners as well for joining us and starting off the year with another fantastic episode of uh, Japan Memo. If you enjoyed this episode, I recommend giving a listen to our two previous episodes on Japan's economic and security role in a Taiwan contingency, which also helps to outline Japan's capabilities in these fields. And for more insightful analysis, I also encourage you to look at past research by the Japan Chair Programme and the IISS more broadly on our website, which is IISS.org. We also hope to connect with you on Twitter, where we are active sharing the latest news and analysis on everything Japanese, geopolitics, and more. You can find us at, at Robert Allen Ward, at Yuka Koshino, and at Togashi Mariko. Thanks again, and see you next time. <laughs>